Hi, Sarah. Hi. How are you doing? I'm good. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Sarah Lee Whitson, Executive Director for the uh, Middle East and North Africa Division of Human Rights Watch. Yes. Um, and there's a lot of uh, human rights stuff uh, in those regions to be talked about, uh, sadly. And that's what I wanted to do. I want to talk, um, well, you know, about the status of the Kurds, for example, other things going on in Syria and other things going on in the region. Um, before we do that, do you want to tell us a little about what Human Rights Watch sees its mission as being? Sure. Um, well, to put it very simply, um, we focus on investigating and documenting human rights abuses in the region. Um, we then work to expose those abuses as widely as we can, both uh, to the broader general public as well as uh, targeted uh, governments uh, that uh, may have a role to play in the abuses. And then we push for change um, because it's uh, not enough for us to be a news reporting organization. We are also an advocacy organization and an activist organization actively seeking to end uh, abuses of human rights and violations of the laws of war. Okay. You mentioned the laws of war. In, in, in defining uh, human rights abuses, do you stick pretty much with the uh, international law definitions or do you uh, have your own ideas about that? No, we uh, are very much constrained by the four corners of international law, um, by which I include human rights law and international humanitarian law, comprised of the treaties, uh, agreements, uh, resolutions uh, of uh, international law bodies, including the United Nations, of course, but also the International Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, as well as uh, uh, definitive commentators on international law, such as the uh, International Commission for the Red Cross. Okay. So why don't we uh, start off by talking about the Kurds, I think is pretty much uh, everyone knows President Trump kind of suddenly decided to withdraw troops in a way that left them in a bad spot. Um, Turkey uh, invaded northern Syria. Um, the fighting, I guess, uh, subsided, and now there's been a deal between Turkey and, and Russia. Um, one question I have, you know, I've been... Uh, referring perhaps too casually, I don't know, to what's already happened as ethnic cleansing. I called it that in a newsletter I put out called the Non-Zero Newsletter. But, and I have to admit, I didn't consult any international law experts, but my logic was there can be no doubt that Erdogan, the, the, you know, the, the head of Turkey, would, would be happy for, for Kurds to vacate that region. Mm -hmm. he, uh, he directed artillery fire and I guess airstrikes and so on into, um, you know, residential areas, um, and it had the effect of leading a bunch of Kurds to flee. Of course, the, the, the violence was itself a violation of international law. Just by virtue of being trans-border, I think most people would say that there was no kind of legitimate self-defense case at that point. Um, but what is, what is the definition of, of ethnic uh, cleansing, and, and would you say it's met, we've met that threshold here? Well, ethnic cleansing is not a legal term. It's not. Um, there is no law that prohibits ethnic cleansing. It's really just a term of popular usage to describe uh, targeted attacks against uh, a, an ethnic group um, that potentially leads to their displacement or worse, um, their, their death. Um, the terms under international law could be, for example, forced displacement, um, where you forcibly displace a civilian population. Um, potentially for purposes of uh, ethnic uh, and demographic change, uh, or for other uh, uh, reasons, for example, to build a dam or, or some other uh, military purpose and, and so forth. So, so the rules uh, with regards to forced displacement are, are within the category that may or may not include targeted actions against an ethnic group. Um, so... We would never discuss uh, 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 what might be happening uh, 
uh, in the Middle East as, as ethnic cleansing, we would describe it as forced displacement or, you know, potentially worse. Did this meet the criterion for forced displacement? Um, well, certainly uh, um, some of the fighting, much of the fighting uh, in Syria has led to the forced displacement of 13 million Syrians, um, whether Kurd or not Kurd. Um, and uh, that's why we now have a population of Syrian refugees of over 6 million people. Um, um, you know, the estimates, of course, in some cases um, range much higher, as well as internal uh, displacements, uh, internally displaced populations throughout Syria. Um, to the extent that the fighting uh, in uh, Syria, the renewed fighting in northeastern Syria, uh, uh, is is obviously causing um, uh, the displacement of civilian population, there is forced displacement taking place. Um, now, you know, obviously not all displacement um, is a violation of the international law. Um, in some cases, it's unavoidable in the time of war. Um, and in fact, you very much want civilians to leave uh, a place of war. And in the duty that we put on governments or armed groups is to warn civilians of imminent fighting, um, to give them an opportunity to safely flee uh, uh, should they seek to do that. But regardless, to avoid targeting uh, areas where civilians remain, um, because the, the rules regarding proportionality and distinction uh, remain regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, that the, whether or not uh, Turkey has met its obligations um, with respect to its military conduct in Turkey is a factual question that would depend on the measures and actions they took to secure the civilian population in areas where they have been fighting. Okay. Of course, even if the government gives adequate notice and says there's going to be a use of force here, um, I, I gather you're saying that might keep them on the right side of international law, but but it would seem to me that you could still have what in casual language is referred to as ethnic cleansing. I mean, that's a a very good way to get a population displaced, a very effective way, right, is to say, well, we're going to pretty soon the artillery is coming. I mean, then you would need to really look closely at the motives, statements, and policies of the government, um, whether or not there is uh, a military interest in a legitimate military conflict um, that they're seeking to pursue, or whether they are, in fact, seeking uh, to change the demography of a territory uh, by displacing one ethnic group um, from an area uh, and typically replacing it with a more favorable um, ethnic group. I think those are the circumstances in which um, uh, one could fairly find uh, 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 ethnic cleansing. You know, I am being careful not to describe uh, Turkey's conduct uh, as intending to cause uh, ethnic uh, displacement or demographic change, because that is a hotly contested issue and one that um, would need a great deal of research and facts to prove and document. Um, because, of course, um, what Turkey would say is that they have millions of Kurds uh, on their Iraqi border. They have millions of Kurds inside their country. Um, and obviously, they've had Kurds uh, at their border in Syria uh, mm-hmm. for many, many years. And their uh, issue is not with the fact of uh, Kurdish civilians present at their borders or inside their country, but of an armed uh, uh, group um, that they believe to be uh, a terrorist uh, group. None of that would justify uh, forcibly displacing a civilian population, um, but it it is a factual uh, inquiry that that would need to be made. I mean, Erdogan's stated objective is to get the withdrawal of the, well, either the troops or at least their arms. That is to say, the the Kurdish kind of uh, militia, whatever, the YPG, I think it's called, um, he wants them to vacate that zone. Um, the uh, on the other, I mean, first of all, I would say it's not clear to me that they have posed a very direct threat to Turkey in and of themselves. I mean, he emphasizes a an apparent connection of a kind between them and the the Turkish Kurds who uh, have been uh, who would like to carve out a, a, a you know a, a Kurdish part of Turkey. But, I mean, all that aside, it seems to me that there can't be much doubt that Erdogan would be plenty happy for pretty much all the Kurds to just vacate that area, right? And he would like to replace them with with the refugees that are now in Turkey who are Syrian but not Kurdish, right? 
I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I yeah, very, you have to be careful. I, I, okay. I very deliberately am not going to attribute right. motives or reach conclusions. Right, right. Um, because it is, you know, it is contested, not only, um, you know, the, the, the narrative that you that you put forward that I think reasonably can be argued. At the same time, um, there are those who say that the Kurds have, in fact, expanded their presence in uh, uh, parts of uh, northeastern Syria because they uh, also have wanted to create a broad swath of territory from which to have autonomy, uh, if not independence in, in Syria, um, yeah. or, you know, so, some kind of autonomous region, probably akin to the the, the Kurdish region, um, and you know within Syria, separate and apart from the Turkish government, this is deeply contested lands, and um, you know the, the presence of of one ethnic group or one sect in in a territory versus another is something that has been you know feuded and argued over for a while. Um, That being said, what we can be very clear on and what we have been very clear on is that um, we don't believe that the creation of a safe zone um, will work. We don't believe that Turkey has thought it through. Um, We don't believe that safe zones uh, in uh, recent history have succeeded in in protecting or keeping safe civilians who have come there, Um, nor uh, do we uh, believe that it would be lawful for Turkey to force uh, Syrians to leave Turkey uh, to return to Syria uh, on the pretext of there being a safe zone. Um, of course, Turkey continues to maintain that it is not and will not force Syrians uh, to return uh, to Syria, um, but that you know it would certainly like uh, to have Syrians return uh, to Syria, which you know is not an unreasonable wish uh, for them to have. I think every government wishes that refugees uh, return at some point to a safe and secure. Uh, uh, state. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, that, that, you know, we have, of course, recently just published uh, a report, uh, a press release on forcible displacement, uh, forced return of Syrian refugees. Um, I think just over a dozen Syrians who we documented have been forcibly returned uh, from Turkey to Syria. And we are very concerned uh, about um, a, a trend that we are beginning to see of uh, Syrians being returned to Turkey on very flimsy pretexts. And so making it harder and harder for Syrians to flee the war in Syria to Turkey. So if they don't want to return, but but Turkey forcibly returns them, that is in and of itself a violation of international law? That is absolutely a violation of the um, Refugee Convention. And, and, and it's a commitment that Turkey has made that it will not forcibly return refugees. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, well, like I said, we have documented several dozen cases, um, as have others. Um, you know, this is in a context where Syria has millions of Syrian refugees. So, you know, one, one really needs to look at the broad picture while keeping an eye out for dangerous trends. Mm-hmm. Now, are there other human rights issues that have arisen by virtue of, of Trump's uh, withdrawal and uh, subsequent developments, aside from the ones we've discussed? Well, I mean, the main one is the Turkish incursion, of course, um, that uh, um, uh, has has led, you know, to uh, obviously attacks on civilians, particularly by Turkish-backed armed groups. Um, in, in many cases, some of the same people in these armed groups that the United States backed for many years. Um, there have been very disturbing videos of executions and beheadings, um, attacks on civilians and civilian homes, causing some of the mass displacement of civilians that we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, I think I think it certainly has been asserted uh, widely in the media, but I don't know that it would. You know, it, it, it is established as fact that this would not be taking place, but for the um, uh, the transfer of some several hundred of U.S. troops, because you know the thousand troops that were there were not, in fact, all moved um, from one part of Syria to another. I mean, uh, if you take Trump as his word, what he said was that Turkey told them they are going to make this incursion whether or not the U.S. moves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that, that his decision um, was based on wanting to protect U.S. troops there. Mm-hmm. Um, whether or not that's true is, is really impossible to know for certain. Okay, you alluded um, to the fact that uh, some of the groups committing atrocities are groups that we and our allies had armed and supported in the past. This raises a whole issue of um, the kind of intervention that happened in Syria. It was largely intervention by proxy, but it was an intervention of sorts. We uh, 
we, as we have done before, I mean, in Afghanistan, for example, we armed uh, combatants, and that's controversial. There are people who uh, supported that and justified it on grounds of human rights, uh, because, um, of course, uh, al-Assad um, is uh, a brutal uh, authoritarian who, who has violated human rights, and that, and that was happening. Um, and then there are people who say, but, you know, this just makes things worse. You fanned the, fame, the flames of a civil war, and now you've got millions of refugees and hundreds of thousands of dead. Now, I assume Human Rights Watch doesn't have a position on that. Well, I mean, it may to the extent that the uh, interventions do involve the violation of international law. I, I guess I would assume it would. But uh, aside from that, it does not have a position. That's right. I mean, we don't take a position on a country's decision to go to war uh, or to take military action, and we don't take a position on armed groups um, that carry out armed attacks uh, against the state or another armed group um, and, and the, the reasons that they may go to war. And we don't judge whether or not a war or an intervention is legal or illegal uh, from the premise that these are fundamentally political uh, uh, calculations and decisions and not really legal ones. We do, however, judge um, the manner in which governments and armed groups carry out hostilities. And so, for example, we would tell a country not to support an armed group that has been um, implicated in serious human rights abuses uh, or, of course, to provide arms to a government that has been implicated in serious human rights abuses. So that would be a proxy, whether the proxy is another state or an armed group. Um, that would be the benchmark for our critique of uh, military intervention or tra transfer of arms to a proxy. Um, however, I think um, we can certainly look at the record uh, to know that it's virtually inevitable um, that uh, armed the arms provided to armed groups uh, is uh, going to be problematic because these armed groups are ultimately not accountable uh, uh, and ultimately probably unknowable uh, to the extent to which a country's own armed forces would be accountable and knowable. Mm -hmm. Even that, of course, can be very problematic, as we saw in Iraq uh, during the U.S.-led war there. Um, and so uh, it, to that regard, we would be extremely uh, skeptical and cautious uh, about observing and monitoring um, how the uh, arms that are being supplied to an armed group uh, is used. When you say skeptical and cautious, you mean um, you think it does bear watching? Is that is that what you're saying, or you think you you would? I mean, I think I would I would I think I would safely observe that the track record of any government providing arms to an armed group uh, has uh, been, you know, particularly in Syria, uniformly uh, uh, problematic, and that the armed groups have sought uh, mandate and mission uh, beyond. Um, what the arming and supplying government uh, intended them to do, um, and that um, the weapons uh, cannot be controlled. Their use of those weapons cannot be controlled. They're inevitably used uh, to carry out abuses and harms. Um, and inevitably, the weapons that the U.S. provides are used to create uh, harms, uh, unlawful harms uh, against civilians. Now, of course, we've, saw that, we've seen that in abundance uh, in Syria. Okay. Now... It seems like uh, another part of Syria that could see, has seen tremendous suffering, could see a lot more is Idlib. The, That's right. um, so the, the Syrian government had, uh, as it slowly took back parts of uh, the country, it would basically arrange, sometimes arrange for the, uh, you know, the, I guess, peaceful evacuation after a certain amount of uh, forceful incentive had been created, but the peaceful evacuation of areas, often these people went to Idlib, um, and I guess sometimes they were, uh, the, I, I guess often they included not just uh, combatants, but, uh, but civilians as well, and I guess sometimes maybe entire ethnic groups in a given area, and, um, and so on, but at any rate, Idlib is now full of people who are thought of by the regime as enemies. Um, and the, the regime would like to retake possession of that land as well, I guess. Uh, Turkey has an interest there too, uh, which I don't totally understand. Maybe you can illuminate that, but, but can you give us your sense for the, the status of things there? 
Yeah, yeah, this, um, I mean, you have really put the finger on what we've tried to focus some tension on in the midst of near global focus on the Turkish incursion, which is the ongoing uh, Syrian and Russian uh, government incursion into Idlib. Um, now, um, we've already uh, documented attacks on civilians, bombardment of civilian areas uh, in uh, Idlib. Um, and uh, if uh, the recent experience uh, in Aleppo, in Homs, and Hama, in other areas we taken by uh, the Syrian government or any indication, we expect to see uh, mass civilian atrocities, indiscriminate bombardment of civilian areas, um, uh, 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 the inability of people to flee uh, the area safely, um, sieges, uh, starvation, uh, and this is what we've documented, of course, in other parts of Syria. Um, so it's you know very frustrating to say the least that there isn't as much attention uh, being put on the imminent humanitarian crisis and the the ongoing violations in Idlib uh, as has been the attention on northeastern Syria. I mean, it may be in fairness to the American media that's because they see a very direct U.S. role uh, in uh, the Turkish incursion and the Turkish harms in northeastern Syria and less control over what Russia. And Syria are doing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, nevertheless, it, it does frustrate one to, 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 to think through why uh, the commentators would see that the U.S. has a role uh, to have troops on the ground to protect Kurds uh, in Syria, but not a role to protect Syrians in Idlib. You know, so, so a lot of this policy is just so riddled with intellectual gaps and logical gaps and practical gaps that it, it is... It is very frustrating. There's no doubt that the Syrian and Russian government's mission is to retake Idlib. Uh, and I would predict that they will do that with far less attention, focus, uh, and condemnation as um, they are retaking of eastern Aleppo. Now, they are uh, in some ways at odds with Turkey in Idlib. Is, is that right? Well, I mean, they... they they are at odds uh, to some extent, but I, I don't imagine that Turkey is going to intervene in Idlib to uh, enter into a direct war with Syria and Russia. So you don't imagine it, you know, some kind of, uh, you know, uh, the, the deal that's already uh, kind of happened between Turkey and Russia, paving the way for some deal that saves a lot of lives in Idlib? Uh, I mean, certainly that's what the Turkish and Russian and Syrian governments have told us, that, you know, coming out of the recent process to form a constitutional committee, to have different uh, factions, including uh, purported opposition factions participating in the constitutional process, that they have and are working to put in place some kind of a transitional peace process for the country. Um, the U.S. has not been part of that process, of course, um, and, you know, whether, whether that results in some kind of peaceful transition for at least parts of the country remains to be seen. Um, however, the track record of Russia and Syria, um, with respect to actual armed opposition components within the country has been merciless. And in fact, people who had left the country who have since returned on promises of amnesty and safe return and so forth uh, have not had that experience. Um, people who have returned have found their property stolen, have been have suffered retaliation, have suffered rearrest, uh, a re-imprisonment. Uh, and so the promises that the Syrian government has made uh, to entice people to return uh, have not been kept. And in the case of Idlib, I mean, um, in, in the past, when the government was trying to clear out an area of insurgents and their what, what the government saw as their civilian supporters, um, there was somewhere in Syria for them to go to, Not even though not all of them did. But with Idlib, we're pretty much out of parts of Syria now for them to go to, right? So You're absolutely right. It's a fishbowl, and they have nowhere to go um, unless some kind of passage is secured via Turkey or even via Iraq. I mean, that's a longer journey, of course. But, for example, many, we already have uh, uh, tens of thousands. I don't know the precise number. Uh, we don't have a precise count yet of Syrians uh, who have fled northeastern Syria to Iraq. Um, Iraq has opened its border to allow fleeing Syrians. Turkey has kept the border closed. So whether or not that's reopened in the wake of an expanded Idlib offensive, 
remains to be seen. And um, it's, I mean, Erdogan is in a very difficult place on that score because public sentiment inside Turkey would be strongly opposed to any addition of new Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. Now, in fact, I saw an analysis uh, showing that if you look at where the, um, the, the refugees have settled in Turkey, they are, they are in districts that had some kind of particular political significance uh, to him. There was tremendous resentment of them in those districts. And it was an analysis that showed what a sheerly political threat um, this is to him. And, and uh, of course, Erdogan doesn't like threats of any kind. No, I uh, know. And I mean, I've, I've heard various people raising concerns that the admission of so many Syrian, so many Kurds was a deliberate effort to demographically re-engineer uh, mm. Turkey. Um, I don't know if the numbers could potentially make a serious dent or significance in that, but certainly um, to the extent that they've settled in Kurdish areas in the southeast, that is significant. In fact, um, I don't think it's been as controlled as the Turkish government had wanted. And in fact, one of the major domestic disputes going on in Syria right now is the, I'm sorry, in Turkey right now is the presence of so many Syrian refugees uh, in uh, Istanbul and Ankara in particular that, uh, and, and some of the internal uh, uh, um, relocation of Syrian refugees. Uh, now underway in Turkey is to demand that Syrians reside in the district for which they received approval to reside. So, for example, in the past several years, Syrian refugees were allowed to live in Istanbul, even if their place of registration was in southeast Turkey. Mm -hmm. That uh, has contributed to popular uh, public sentiment against Syrian refugees in Istanbul and Ankara. And many say that part of the reason why Erdogan's party lost the mayoral elections in both those cities um, was in part due to the presence of so many Syrians unregistered for those provinces and municipalities. And now that's why you're seeing the government trying to push Syrians internally to their original places of registration. Okay. So as for Idlib, do you not see any particularly hopeful, plausible scenario in terms of uh, getting the issue somehow resolved with, with minimal uh, death and suffering? I mean, certainly there is a scenario where that can be done, and that is to allow those who feel at risk to flee, um, but that would require Turkey, Lebanon, uh, uh, Iraq, and Jordan to cooperate in admitting more Syrian refugees. Mm -hmm. um, it would allow some kind of an amnesty for members of armed groups, um, and uh, it would allow some kind of assurances of safety. It would also require surrender by the armed groups in Idlib, and I, I have, to be honest, no insights into whether or not that is something that they would contemplate. Well, and, and, and that kind of thing, I mean, anything other than all of them going to another country would require a kind of trust of the Assad government on their part, right? Uh, well, probably less trust than it would require uh, than to believe that they can continue to live peacefully within Syria. Um, yeah, I just mean, you know, if the deal is, uh, I mean, Aunt, like I would imagine most of them who hear the word amnesty to have skepticism as to whether Assad would follow through on that. Yes. And that's part of the problem. So um, now are you, is your family from Syria? Your family is from the Middle East. Is that right? My mother's family is from the Middle East. Yes. Okay. Is that, uh, but you weren't, uh, did you, were you born there or were? No, I was born in the United States. Okay. Does this, does this, uh, inform your whole view of this in any way that you want to absolutely. talk about? Yeah, no, absolutely. My mother's family is Armenian, and uh, my mother was a refugee, born in a refugee camp. My grandmother was born in a refugee camp in Lebanon. My family survived the Armenian genocide, those that survived, I should say, uh, ending up as refugees in the Middle East and have been present in Jordan, Syria, uh, 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 um, Lebanon, um, Palestine, when it was Palestine, later when it became Israel, uh, four generations now and have lived through and, and suffered through the wars of the region. So I, you know, I, I 
consider myself to have a great deal of skin in the game. Um, and, you know, I have very direct experience of what the refugee experience is like, what the experience of being vulnerable civilians in a war zone is like. I've had family members who've been killed uh, in these wars, injured in these wars, destroyed economically, certainly by these wars. Um, so um, the, this, this, uh, the, the, the lived experience of, of people in the Middle East is something that is very real and personal to me. Okay. So as we look elsewhere in the Middle East, what are the kind of the biggest issues on your radar screen right now? Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, certainly the, the military conflicts, um, which involve the most immediate and direct harm to humans, um, tend to take priority of attention at Human Rights Watch and me personally. And so in that score, the war in Yemen, the ongoing war in Yemen, uh, is uh, a tremendous problem and, and, and second only to, of course, the war in Syria. The ongoing war in Libya, uh, the ongoing war in Egypt, in Egypt-Sinai, which probably is the most secret war, uh, the ongoing military occupation of Palestinian territories. Um, these are, you know, the, the uh, most profound areas of concern um, because of the immediate helplessness of of people whose lives are at risk by forces that they have no control over. Uh, And the the very disturbing uh, aspect of many of these conflicts is, like in Syria, um, we've lost the thread of this ever having been a war of a civilian population or an uprising of civilian population demanding its rights from a government but rather geopolitical, uh, in some cases global, uh, contests of power uh, by, you know, between Russia and the United States, between Iran uh, and, and the, the Gulf, you know, in terms of who controls the Middle East and, and uh, treating it as, as it was 100 years ago, a chessboard to be carved up uh, into zones of influence and spheres of influence. And um, that is the most frustrating and problematic uh, aspect of many of these conflicts, um, which is that the, the people of the region and their say so and their interests and their needs uh, matter so little. Um, I think beyond that, um, what dominates uh, our attention and my attention is the extreme uh, uh, repression um, faced by the peoples of the Middle East and North Africa at the hands of their own government in terms of basic fundamental rights. So freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of association, religious freedom, women's rights. These are, you know, this is a very blighted region in terms of basic respect uh, for, uh, for citizens and residents alike. And, of course, as someone who's headquartered here in New York as, as an American, um, where I uh, tend to focus my personal attention is where uh, the United States has a hand in aiding and abetting the harms and abuses. So we may not have much control as as American taxpayers, as American citizens, over what Syria or Russia uh, does uh, in terms of its brutalities, but we do have a say and a role in what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen. In fact, the United States is a party to that conflict, Mm -hmm. or what Egypt is doing to its citizens, torturing, uh, executing, uh, detaining and arresting tens of thousands of people. Um, notwithstanding the provision of billion and a half dollars in U.S. Uh, arms sales, uh, similarly uh, for Israel. Um, so I think for Americans, um, the vast majority of their attention, in fact, their, their responsibility and duty as citizens is to focus on where its own government, where our own government is doing harm in the region um, and where the United States is arming, aiding and abetting oppressive, brutal governments that are terrorizing their own citizens or the citizens of another country. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that sounds like it's uh, in a lot of different places where, where, where the United States is embedding very problematic behavior in your view. That is, yes. Um, so, for example, I mean, I mean, Yemen uh, is, as you said, probably the biggest ongoing um, catastrophe. We did support the Saudi intervention. There was conflict there before the Saudi intervention, but that's that's taken it to a new level, right? Well, we, we just to be clear, we continue to support the Saudi coalition in the war with Yemen. Mm-hmm. So even though uh, the Trump administration ended refueling support, which was one of the main ways in which we were actively assisting um, the Saudi coalition in its war in Yemen, 
we continue, um, to our knowledge and understanding, to provide targeting support and assistance. Um, and our analysis is that the U.S. remains a party to the conflict, uh, not just someone who's indirectly aiding and abetting, but but some but 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 uh, uh, actively a participant in the conflict. Uh, and so libel itself or complicity in war crimes that are ongoing there. That's separate and apart from uh, the $100 billion plus in arms sales that uh, President Trump has inked and before him, of course, President Obama, and the you know very dramatic extent to which American uh, supply bombs have been used to terrorize civilians in Yemen. Mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned... Palestine. So is the is Human Rights Watch's main concern there kind of the clear cut violations of international law? I mean, I gather that the establishment of settlements in a territory uh, acquired by force is in and of itself, by most reckoning, uh, a violation of international law. Is that right? Uh, it's a war crime. Um, the uh, uh, Rome Statute, which is the basis for the International Criminal Court, uh, as well as the Geneva Conventions, uh, consider the transfer of an occupier's population into occupied territory uh, war crimes. And those who are responsible for planning and implementing the establishment and building of settlements uh, in occupied territory are guilty of war crimes. And in fact, the reason why the International Criminal Court has opened an examination into Uh, The situation of Palestine um, is uh, in part to look at the conduct of the Gaza war, um, but also in part, uh, the most recent Gaza war, I should say, but also in part uh, to look at the continued expansion uh, and transfer of Israeli settlers to occupied territory. Mm -hmm. And um, as for other issues that are commonly cited there, for example, the fact that West Bank Palestinians don't get to vote um, in the elections that uh, determine the government that actually ultimately does rule them. Um, is that not a Human Rights Watch consideration per se? Because it's, it's not so much an issue of, of international law. It, it, it's, more, it's more a question of kind of in the context of what is supposed to be a democracy, Israel. Um, you know, there, there, there are some issues that obviously arise in terms of the equal application of the law, but, um, but is that not, in, that's not your issue, so to speak? Oh, that's very much our issue. Um, we have extensively focused on the uh, systematic, uh, deliberate discrimination on ethnic and racial grounds against Palestinians uh, in occupied territories, but also within Israel proper itself. Um, and um, part of the challenge has been that occupation law, the, the Geneva Conventions and the laws of occupation, actually permit an occupying force to restrict uh, certain rights, uh, including political rights, including voting and participation, on the notion that this is a temporary occupation. It's a military occupation, and so military rule is appropriate. And under military rules, which are meant to be emergency military rules, you can temporarily uh, suspend basic human rights and basic political rights and basic civil rights. Of course, we are now in a situation of permanent occupation, um, an occupation which Israel has made very clear. It has no intention of ending except for the areas that it uh, illegally is annexing. And so that is why, in fact, in a report that we intend to release later this month, we we are arguing uh, to shift our analysis to focus on human rights law and the obligation of Israel to provide uh, basic civil and political rights for all of the people under its control, whether they're Palestinians or Israelis, and to use as a benchmark for the rights that all of the people under its control should have, the benchmark, the standard that, that it grants uh, Israelis within uh, its Green Line territory. Okay. I, I guess what I, what I had in mind is that presumably what the Israeli government says when organizations like Human Rights Watch complain about some of this stuff is, Hey, compared to what? In Saudi Arabia, nobody gets to vote, blah, 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 blah. You're only focusing on us because, relatively speaking, we are a more liberal country than Saudi Arabia, right? That has absolutely no relevance or interest to us. We work in over 100 countries around the world, and we judge uh, governments not by the lowest uh, uh, you know, lowest actor, worst actor on the planet. Um, human rights are not relative. Um, there is a very clear, clearly defined and articulated standard of 
what the minimum basic human rights standards are for every citizen on this world, and that is the standard we use. It's the standard of international human rights law. It matters nothing uh, to a citizen in Morocco who's being tortured that there are more citizens tortured in uh, um, Algeria. Mm -hmm. uh, and it matters nothing uh, to a Palestinian uh, child who's uh, uh, been killed for participating in a protest uh, or, or, or injured participating in a protest in Gaza um, that, you know, 100 uh, uh, youths were killed in Baghdad participating in protests. Um, every country's human rights record has to stand on its own. Okay. Um but speaking of countries like Saudi Arabia, is there, do you have in your mind kind of a ranking from uh, most egregious violators of human rights to least in, in that area? I mean, there's a lot of it going around. I mean, you mentioned Egypt, Saudi Arabia. There are other states um, that uh, violate human rights on a fairly routine basis. Is there, uh, I know, I, I doubt Human Rights Watch has an official scale, but is there any, anything you would want to say? Uh, about what some of the most problematic countries are? Well, you know, like I said, I mean, we we don't rank countries. Um, I think Freedom House, which is the U.S. government's uh, human rights organization, does rank countries on some criteria of civil and political rights. Um, you know, like I said, the primary focus is on governments that are actively engaged in war and carrying out violations of the laws of war. Uh, and, and violations of international humanitarian law, causing immediate loss of life, immediate injury. Uh, and to that end, um, the wars that I mentioned, the conflicts I mentioned, where there's active military combat, uh, active military control are the ones where I would consider the most emergency situations. And so the war in Yemen at the hands of the Saudi coalition, as well as the Houthis, uh, the war in Libya and the various factions, but most importantly, the hand of the UAE in France in providing arms to one faction, uh, the war in the Sinai, um, the ongoing military conflict in the occupied Palestinian territories, um, the, um, you know, emergent and on and off wars that we see in Iraq. Of course, the war against ISIS ended recently, um, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the Iraq has been in a state of low-level conflict, varying levels of conflict uh, since the U.S. invasion uh, of Iraq. Okay, you mentioned Libya. That's an interesting case <clears throat> where there was... It started as a humanitarian intervention. I, I mean, by the uh, by that I mean the American role in destabilizing the government and ultimately in um, uh, getting rid of the regime started out as a humanitarian intervention that was consistent with international law because it was uh, authorized by the Security Council. Um, and then the wording in the resolution was, some would say, open-ended enough to to permit the U.S. and its allies to shift to flat-out regime change. And basically, it was about the protection of civilian populations. And in fact, initially, the focus was very much on one city where there seemed to be uh, an, an imperiled population. And, uh, and the resolution authorized the provision of Western air support to, to keep the skies clear of Libyan aircraft, protect the population, but there was a phrase in there like by something like by whatever any means necessary or something that was then used to justify a flat out regime change effort that a lot of people, I think, now agree left Libya in a much worse uh, place. Um, and, and, and perhaps the region. I mean, it sent weapons all across the regions into black markets and so on. And it is the situation is still not stabilized. I, I guess HRW doesn't. I, I, well, let me say there's a larger issue there about the whole right to protect thing. I mean, initially, back after World War II, international law, uh, so far as it pertained to security, was largely about preventing transborder aggression. Right to protect has kind of evolved as a as a grounds um, for humanitarian intervention that has at least some basis now, I guess, in international law. Is that is that right, that it, that it has to some extent been instantiated in international law as a legitimate thing? Yeah, I mean, there is the so-called duty of the responsibility to protect. Um, uh, did, did I say right to protect? I meant responsibility to yeah, protect. Yeah, right. So it, it did affirm the responsibility of states uh, to uh, use, uh, uh, you know, 
to, to take actions to prevent atrocities. Mm-hmm. Um, and that has been the grounds on which various states have argued or pushed for military intervention. Um, you know, when the Responsibility to Protect was designed, crafted, debated, and so forth, the military intervention was meant to be the last resort. Um, however, we see increasingly it's used as the first resort um, before any other means are used. And the Responsibility to Protect was meant to be a multilateral, a multinational, uh, UN sanctioned process. Um, but we've seen it used as a unilateral or, you know, very small lateral uh, tool uh, of military intervention. The Human Rights Watch doesn't generally take a position on military intervention, except when it may determine um, that there's a need uh, for urgent humanitarian intervention because of imminent mass atrocities, um, and where we conclude that the uh, benefit of intervention will outweigh the harm. Uh, Human Rights Watch did not reach that conclusion uh, in Libya. Um, uh, We did not find that there were imminent mass atrocities uh, and that were also ones that uh, would benefit from a military intervention that would do more good than harm. Um, And uh, I think that what the experience with Libya has borne out is that there are no shortcuts uh, to civilian protection. There are no shortcuts in military intervention. And I think what Obama has recently reflected on and concluded was that the military intervention in Libya um, was uh, his worst failing and his worst decision. Um, at least that's how it's been reported in the media. Um, and, you know, I, and I think that there's a lot of merit uh, to that view because there's a fantasy uh, among some uh, outside observers thousands and thousands of miles away that you could just show up with some planes, kill a few people, and bam, civilians are protected and democracy will flourish. But that's never how it works. And Libya is really a case study example of, of why that's the case. Um, my own contention is that to responsibly undertake uh, humanitarian military intervention, in addition to having really truly exhausted all diplomatic alternatives and options, which I don't think was the case uh, in Libya, um, that there needs to be some kind of medium to long term plan um, that plays out how civilian protection will take place. I think it was utterly predictable um, that simple decapitation of the top leadership in Libya in a situation where multiple governments were sending arms to multiple armed groups uh, in the country um, that did not have any developed institutions, deliberately disabled, dysfunctioning institutions under Gaddafi's 40 years of rule, was bound to see civil war emerge, bound to see it become a contest of control, not just of internal factions, um, but of external uh, global powers and regional powers. Um, And so the question I ask those who are advocating for military intervention is, what's the plan for protecting civilians three years down the line and five years down the line? Mm -hmm. You know, many people cite the example of Bosnia and the the no-fly zone that was imposed as, as an important measure of civilian protection. And what I always point out uh, there is that there were, uh, you know, I think I will say, i probably get the number wrong, 50,000 uh, peacekeeping troops that remained in a tiny uh, geographic space with a tiny population for decades. And so I always urge people to give me the pro rata number population and geographic area wise of peacekeeping troops they will urge the commitment of for an equal number of years, as we saw in Bosnia. Uh, to maintaining the peace and protecting civilians. And when that calculation comes into play, um, the enthusiasts of a quick and short and easy uh, humanitarian intervention uh, typically uh, start to stumble. Mm-hmm. And, and Bosnia was, in a way, a relatively simple case. Is that crazy to say? I mean, first of all, it was, it was authorized. The intervention was authorized by the Security Council, as I recall. So it was uh, legit under international law. And I recall the intervention being um, fairly decisive uh, in the short run, but you're saying the the commitments kind of keep on going for some time after after the intervention in general, even even almost in some of the better case scenarios? Well, I mean, I I certainly would not speak to the to the political complexities and nuances of Bosnia since it's not an area that I'm remotely an expert in. But what I do know, as a matter of fact, is that the U.N. maintained peacekeeping troops there for decades Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and not a small number, not 5000 troops, but much, much bigger number of troops. Obviously, they wouldn't have peacekeeping troops there on the ground if they thought their job was done. 
Right. Um, and, you know, there is virtually no planning for the day after military intervention. Mm -hmm. And there is often a propagandistic desire to sell military interventions as cheap, easy, and short. And they never are. Mm -hmm. Okay, I guess we can leave it on that. That was a pretty uh, final note. Uh, <laughs> uh, so thank you so much, Sarah, for taking the time. Now, where can pe people can find you on Twitter, right? What, what's yeah. your Twitter handle? It's Sarah Lee One, S-A-R-A-H-L-E-H-1. L-E-A-H, L-1, the digit one. Uh, I'm at Robert Ryder on Twitter. Where where else can people find you uh, on the web? I guess HRW for one thing, right? HRW.org. We publish all of our publications and commentary there. Okay. Well, thank you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.